So as Eric said, I'm Manuel Fuchs, and my talk is called Emulating Nintendo Game Boy CPU with Elm. And I'm talking about this because I wrote a Game Boy emulator for my latest side project, because I was looking for something different from work, and I ended up pouring endless hours into this emulator thing. But it's not totally worth it. <laughs> so before I talk about the details, I want to quickly demo it to you so you know what we are talking about. Doesn't come up, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> huh, here we go. So I don't see this, so I have to do it like this. All right, so this is what Ambo looks like. This is the special Oslo M Day uh, version in big. So, and everything you see here is purely Elm. There are only two ports, one for pushing raw pixel data onto the canvas and one for uh, pushing raw audio samples to the web audio API. So with a click, I can select the ROM here and I will select, of course, Tetris. So I have to wait a bit for the title screen to be over, but after that, here we go. So I can play this like you would expect it to work, right? It has sound, audio, graphics, everything. Of course, can run other games, but I don't want to waste time doing playing games on, on stage. <laughs> All right, so at first glance, that seems like a very bad idea. <laughs> um, because emulating hardware is a super low-level task, right? It's imperative as it gets, it's performance critical, and Elm is pretty much on the other end of the spectrum, right? We have a high-level functional language that compiles to JavaScript that then runs in browsers, which then run on CPUs, and you get the point, right? I once talked to emulation folks online about this project, and the most memorable response I got was, I am baffled by your choice of technology. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they're right. So today I want to show you that Elm can do stuff like this, and most of its strength uh, also work in other domains than web development. But before we start, a quick disclaimer. So this stuff is non-trivial. So uh, due to time constraints, we have a 20-minute talk slot. I have to make some concessions. I will omit important details and functionality. So this is not a tutorial on how to write a Game Boy emulator in 20 minutes. But it will be a glimpse into the world of emulation. With that being said, Hi, everyone. My name is Manuel Fuchs, and my talk is called Emulating a Ridiculously Oversimplified Version of the Nintendo Game with CPU with Elm. <laughs> All right. Quick overview about the Game Boy architecture. <laughs> so all the boxes you see here are components of the Game Boy. And every one of those components is interesting in its own right, and it would deserve its own talk. So for example, the, pixel proce uh, the audio processing unit here synthesizes audio out of thin air. The pixel processing unit at the bottom creates the four shades of green graphics that we all know and love in a way to, without, without like using up too much memory. And even the cartridges have special hardware in them because some games weigh multiple megabytes even though the Game Boy can only address 64 kilobytes. This is what we will talk about today, so I just omitted everything that's not the CPU, not the RAM, hence the talk title. And this is how we would encode in Elm, our whole Game Boy architecture. And again, this is what we're talking about, right? We just have a CPU and RAM, and whenever you see this type in my presentation, I mean this, a record of CP CPU state and RAM state. Okay, up to the first thing we need to learn about CPUs, so CPU registers. So CPU registers are tiny storage units that are inside the CPU, and they're used for intermediate values for your calculations. They're super fast to access, read and write, way faster than RAM even. There's a table that shows all the registers that the Game Boy CPU has, and the ones with a one-letter name can store eight bits, a byte, and the ones with a two-letter name can store 16 bits, of course. Some of those have special meanings or purposes. For example, the PC here. The PC stands for Program Counter, and this is a memory address where the Game Boy will look to find the next instruction it has to execute. I will explain what instructions are later. SP down here is also a memory address. This is the topmost element of the stack, but the stack won't be important for this talk. The F register, F stands for flags. So some instructions set or unset bits in this register to give us information about the last instruction's result. For example, if we decrement a value and it becomes zero, the zero flag will be turned to one. 
And we can use this to branch out and have like logic and if statements, for basically. Lastly, the A register is kind of special. You can use it freely as you want. But some instructions, mostly arithmetic instructions, will write the result implicitly to this register. So you shouldn't store anything you really like want to take care of. So we'll see an example of this later. How would we encode this in Elm? Again, we could just use a record, right? We have for every register a field and an appropriate type for the value inside this register. And I use word 8 and word 16 here, and I have to do a quick detour to explain what those are, right? So unluckily, Elm doesn't have native types for 8-bit unsigned data, right? And the same is true for 16-bit. But luckily, Elm makes it very easy for us to implement something like this. This is what it could look like. So we have a module called word 8 that creates or defines a custom type named word8 that wraps an integer. And we don't expose the constructor here, so this type will become an opaque type. So no other module than this module could create values of word8. What other modules are supposed to do is create um, word8 values from the fromInt function, which will mask off the least significant bit, byte of the value and put it into word8. So CPU instructions. I mentioned them before, and you probably have an idea what they are. Those are the low-level instructions the CPU can perform in hardware. So for example, adding two numbers together, incrementing, decrementing values, reading or writing for RAM. You get the point. And in Elm, we would talk about them like this. They're functions from our model to our model. Very like similar to what update in the Elm architecture does. And every instruction can modify the whole Game Boy state. So if we have more uh, components that we would emulate, uh, instructions could change those as well. Here's another one to drive the point home, right? We have our state and pipe it through all the instructions. In the end, we get the resulting uh, state of the Game Boy. So again, on the left-hand side, we have the registers here, and the program counter is pointing into memory at address 0 here. And at address 0, the instruction nop is, uh, like, is encoded there. And nop means no operation. This literally does nothing. And the Game Boy is so fast, it can like do one million of those per second. <laughs> um, so. If the Game Boy executes these instructions, it automatically increments the PC by one. So now the address is, uh, the PC is pointing to an address one. This is the uh, or B instruction that takes the value in register A and B, combines both using bitwise or, and stores the result back in A. This is one example of an, an instruction that uses A implicitly. Again, increment afterwards, add BC, adds the value of B and C together, and writes it to A. And dec C decrements the value inside register C. But obviously, the Game Boy doesn't store strings like knob in RAM to encode what the instruction do, uh, instructions do, right? So this is what actually is going on in RAM. So on the left-hand side, you see the address. On the rightmost side, you see the mnemonic as before. And in the middle, you see how it's encoded. So every instruction is just a byte in RAM. Um, interestingly, though, though, you see in address 3 and 4, we have the hexadecimal value of 15. So it, it's, it's both dec C, right? But it's wrong in this case. <laughs> because the previous instruction at, uh, at address 4 is LDCD8. Pretty obvious what it does, right? <laughs> so this is loading a value into register C, load, LD stands for load, and D8 means immediate 8-bit data. So it's the data that immediately follows the opcode. So in this case, 15 is the value that has, will be loaded into register C and is not decrement C. Okay, how would we implement those um, instructions in our super simplified emulator. We have seen it's a function from Game Boy to Game Boy, so the glorious knob instruction we have seen before is this. Basically identity. It doesn't do anything. It just takes the model and returns it again. Here's another one. Load BC. This is loading the value of register C into B. And what we do for that is just we update the record, state, the record for the CPU so that B contains C, and then we update the Game Boy state so that it contains the updated CPU state. The instruction set of the Game Boy contains around 500 of those instructions. <laughs> and you need to implement all of them to get like Tetris running. <laughs> and what you see here is a picture of the sheets I used to keep track of what I had implemented and what it was missing. <laughs> all right, the last component we need to talk about is RAM. And if you recall, this, the CPU isn't really connected to RAM, right? So the CPU is connected to something that's called a memory management unit. And I will briefly explain what it does. So if you want to communicate with other components, the only way to do so is via RAM. So at least it's, it looks like RAM to the CPU. When the CPU is reading from a certain memory address, for example, the MMU will route the read to the joypad, and we get back a byte that indicates which buttons have been pressed. 
And it also works the other way around. I could write at a certain memory address, and the MMU will then tell the APU that produces the sound to change the pitch of a certain channel. But again, 20 minutes, so this is what we're building. <laughs> we're connecting this directly to RAM, and it's enough to run a simple program. Quickly, we just wrap array of word 8, have some convenience accessors to that so we can uh, use it more easily. No magic going on, it's just a bunch of bytes. With all the types out of the way and the infrastructure, uh, we can write the main emulation loop. And this is the function that will be called around a million times per second, so it needs to be super fast. This is what it looks like, at least for a simple emulator. <laughs> uh, first, we read the opcode from uh, RAM based on the current PC value of the registers inside the CPU. Then we will use this opcode to look up an instruction handler, the function from Game Boy to Game Boy, with this function. Then we will update the PC so it's incremented to point to the next instruction in RAM. And then we execute the instruction handler. Easy. So this is what the find instruction handler looks like. It's just a mapping from bytes to functions of Game Boy to Game Boy. In my emulator, this is like a 2,000 line file. <laughs> just a mapping. And this is all we need. And you might uh, wonder, all we need for what? So I built a demo. I built another emulator <laughs> that uses only what we've been talking about. So it's a super dumbed down version of the emulator. And we will emulate a program that calculates Fibonacci numbers and stores them in RAM. And even though it's oversimplified a lot, this program would actually run on a real Game Boy. All right. Let's see if I can make this happen now so I can actually see what I'm doing, because otherwise it will be hard. Uh, somewhere. All right. Don't be scared. I will explain what it does. So <laughs> on the top, you see all the CPU register state right now. It's zero for all registers. On the left-hand side, you see, oh, this is fucked up. Nah, anyway. <laughs> On the left-hand side, you see uh, the contents of RAM, and they are interpreted as instructions. So we don't need to look up what hex 21 is to figure out what the CPU will do. On the right-hand side, you see the contents of RAM. And sadly, it's a bit clipped, so meh. it's not so important anyway, because on the left-hand side is what you're going to read. And on the, the green marked area, uh, the yellow marked area, you will see the resulting values that we have been calculating, the Fibonacci numbers. And the uh, green marker highlights the position where the program counter is pointing to. So right now, the program counter is zero, so we're pointing at the first instruction. All right, let's do this. So the first instruction is LDHL hex 24. So this is loading the value of 24 into register HL. If you look at on top, L now contains 24. Awesome. Next instruction is loading 1 into B, and the instruction after was, is loading 1 into C. We will use B and C throughout this program to keep track of the previous two Fibonacci numbers we've been calculating. D will be loaded with C. See if it works. It does. And we use D as some sort of um, iterator and uh, imperative uh, programming language. Like we, would, we will decrement this until we reach zero, and then we stop the program. All right, now we are actually inside the loop we have been coding. Uh, and we will load the value of C into A. So A will become 1. Then we will add the value of B into A. Hopefully, it will too. Awesome. Then we will load the value of C into B. We're shifting the value one to the left. It doesn't do anything right now. And then we load the result that's been, that we have been calculating from A into C. So again, B and C are containing is containing the, the last uh, two calculated Fibonacci numbers. Okay, this one is scary. This is load in parentheses HL plus A. <laughs> And this is an, uh, an instruction that is done, or inside the instruction set for stuff like this, iterating and writing values to RAM. So we write the value inside register A into memory, where HL is pointing to, currently 24, and we then increment HL afterwards. This is a performance optimization, basically. So if I do this, we can see that 2 showed up at hex 24, and L became 25. Then we will decrement D. I told you, we will decrement this until it re reaches 0. All right, jump NZ9. So this will change the contents of the program counter to 9 if the zero flag has not been turned on. And the instruction uh, we had before, decrement D, did not result in a zero, so the flag is not turned on. So we will change our PC to 9. And here we are again. We will loop through this again and again. So I do it a bit quicker. And if you look in the yellow mark area, I see 2, 3, 5. 
eight, and so on. If I quicker, you can see all the Fibonacci numbers turning up. And as I said, this is a real Game Boy program. It would run on a Game Boy. You would have no way of seeing the results because it's in RAM, but yeah. All right, what would be next? Like, if we take this, what we have talked about, and want to build a real emulator, what would we need to do? Spoiler alert, it will be a lot. <laughs> so first, we haven't talked about CPU interrupts. So this, these are like event handlers. So when I press a button, um, the joypad component can send the CPU an interrupt, interrupting what the CPU is currently doing, setting the PC to a handling function for maybe pressing buttons. And I have a way uh, inside this handler to switch back to the old PC again. We haven't talked about this. This is very important to have fluid gameplay. Also, instruction timings. All the 500 instructions we saw uh, run at different speeds. And we have to emulate this correctly when we want to produce sound, right? <laughs> Obviously, other components. We haven't talked about graphics, sound. And I could do like 10 talks about this. <laughs> This is very interesting, uh, quirks and accuracy. So the Game Boy hardware has bugs. And Nintendo had no way of fixing them, right? Because the Game Boys were out there, and games were relying on those bugs. So we have to emulate the bugs as well. <laughs> and the most important part is basically performance. Like, I spent at least 50% of development time on this thing just improving performance. For the first month, it like ran at one frame per second, and I, I didn't have graphics, so <laughs> super slow. Uh, so this is an interesting thing to talk about. So if you have questions about this, or about the details, or like, I don't know, whatever, you can catch me in the hall if you like. And if you're not here watching this at home, you can find me on Twitter or mslack as at Malax. I really love talking about this stuff, so don't be shy. If you want to like learn more without talking to me, which is fine, <laughs> you can use this link. I have uh, a big readme there with resources to get you started on low-level programming or more details about the Game Boy. There are even links to three games that you can play on your iPhone that teaches you programming the way we saw it on the second demo. And that's basically it. Thank you very much.